Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Myra Alvarez, and I am the Director of Public Health Policy in the Office of Health Reform at the Department of Health and Human Services. And on behalf of the department and the administration, I am honored to welcome you all to our first ever Town Hall on Minority Health. We'd like to thank the White House for their help in organizing and hosting this important event. And we are especially thankful to those of you here with us in the room and also the many of you joining via social media outlets like Twitter and Facebook. Just a quick reminder, please post questions on Twitter using the hashtag Minority Health and we'll do our best to respond to you during today's discussion. For questions we are unable to address live today, we will try to follow up online after the event to make sure you get the information you need. In April, we commemorate National Minority Health Month to raise awareness of the health disparities that continue to affect racial and ethnic minorities and other underserved communities across the country. But we also take this time to celebrate. We celebrate the Affordable Care Act and its tremendous strides in making health care more affordable and accessible for minorities and all Americans. <laughs> the health care reform law is working to reduce health disparities and achieve health equity in our nation. This year's Minority Health Month theme is Health Equity Can't Wait. Act now in your community. We are a nation of diverse communities, and that diversity strengthens our country. But health is vital to that strength. The opportunity to recommit ourselves as a federal government, as an American people, to reducing inequities in healthcare is an investment in our country's physical and economic well-being. As a Latina, as the daughter of Mexican immigrants, a conversation about improving the health of minority communities is personal. But I'm not unique. Conversations about health are personal to all of us. When we think of the waiting room or confusing insurance forms, we think of our mother, we think of our grandfather, our family and our friends, the people we love and how we do anything to keep them healthy. And despite the advancement in science and progress our nation has made over the last few decades, minority communities still lag behind the general population on many health fronts. They're less likely to get the preventive care they need to stay healthy more likely to suffer from serious illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, or breast or colon cancer. And they're less likely to have access to quality health care. But today, we have before us a renewed effort to combat the health disparities that too many communities have faced for too long. To help us engage in this important dialogue, we have a distinguished group of panelists. With us, we have the nation's Surgeon General, Dr. Regina Benjamin. V. B. Smith, iconic restaurateur and healthy lifestyle advocate. Our acting deputy assistant secretary for minority health and the director of the Office of Minority Health, Dr. Nadine Gracia. And with us from the media, our guests joining us this afternoon are Dr. Dirk Schroeder, Executive Vice President of Univision Hola Doctor, which provides health content and valuable patient tools to over 150,000 Spanish speakers each month. And Dr. Thais Gaines, Health Editor of NBC's TheGrio.com, a news community site devoted to reaching the African American community and reaches an estimated 766,000 people each month. Thank you for being here. A panel of experts, but most importantly, a panel of individuals dedicated to improving the health of minority communities and constantly looking for new ways to do more. And nowhere is this more apparent than in the policies put forth by President Obama. The Obama administration has made improving the health of Americans and especially vulnerable communities a top priority since the beginning. Here to welcome us to the White House and tell us a bit more is Cecilia Munoz the Director of the Domestic Policy Council, which coordinates the domestic policy making process in the White House. We are fortunate to have Cecilia, who has a long history advocating for the health of racial and ethnic communities, not only in her previous position as Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, where she oversaw the Obama administration's relationships with state and local governments, 
but also in her 20-year career at the National Council La Raza, the nation's largest Latino civil rights organization, where she served as Senior Vice President for the Office of Research, Advocacy, and Legislation. Please join me in welcoming Cecilia. Thank you, Maida. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to see all of you here. I have, um, frankly, a number of heroes of mine are in this room, not the least of which is Dr. Benjamin, who I'm going to have the privilege of introducing in a minute. Um, but you all are here uh, for the same reason we're here, that you've made uh, careers of working on making sure that we address health disparities in this country. Um, and nothing could be more important to the, to the well-being of Americans as a whole as making sure that we all have the capacity to live healthy lives. This is something that the President has dedicated himself to. This is something that, as an administration, we take great pride in our work on this effort. Uh, and as it's Minority Health Month, this is a great opportunity to focus on how we address those health disparities, how we make sure that everyone has access to the health care that they need, and how we can really be making the advancements that we need uh, to, to support our country and the well-being of the American people by making sure that people have the, the capacity and the tools they need to live the healthiest possible lives and to get the care that they need when they get sick. It seems simple enough, but this group of people assembled here today knows um, that it's not that simple, and that's why you're here, and we appreciate very much the fact that you're here. As Maida said, we are, among other things, looking at the work that lies ahead, but also celebrating the Affordable Care Act and its uh, extraordinary accomplishments which are already in place and the accomplishments which are, which are yet to come as the law comes fully online in 2014. We know, for example, that more than 2.5 million young Americans have access to health coverage on their parents' plans as a result of the Affordable Care Act. We know that huge numbers of Americans have access to preventive care without co-pays and co-insurance, including 6 million Latinos and 5 million African Americans who received preventive care services last year without co-pays and co-insurance. This is a huge development. These are um, huge results for people, and of course we're going to be building on those results day to day, month to month, year by year, as we continue to implement the Affordable Care Act. Maida and I have some history together in that shortly after the Affordable Care Act was passed, she and I traveled around the country meeting with community leaders and, uh, and audiences in town hall meetings around the country to talk about the implications of this law. And we talked in particular about preventive care because we know, as Latinas, and I know that this is true in the African American community as well, that far too many, we know far too many people who get their health care by going to the emergency room. Um, and that by making sure that people have access to preventive care, that you don't have to choose between, uh, to use a story that Maida told more than once in these sessions, uh, between uh, getting your annual mammogram and maybe having a little spending money for your teenager, um, that, that uh, we can get out in front of conditions that disproportionately affect communities of color, like diabetes, like cardiovascular disease, like certain forms of cancer. By making preventive care available, the Affordable Care Act gives us a chance to get in front of conditions before we're having to pay for treatment for those conditions. That all by itself is an extraordinary accomplishment. And of course, it's one of many accomplishments under the Affordable Care Act that are already affecting people's lives around the country. Uh, so we have a record of, uh, of achievements that we can celebrate, but more importantly, a record of achievements that we have to build on. And that's why you're here. That's why we're holding this session today. My job really is to thank all of you for doing this work day in and day out, for being our partners, for doing the work that you do all across the country. It's incredibly important, and, and we're grateful to have you as partners in this effort. Thank you for spending the day with us today uh, and for doing this work. And with that, I have the great privilege of introducing really one of my personal heroes. Um, I think you already know her. She is an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary physician, who uh, dedicated her work to a small community uh, in the Gulf Coast region near where she grew up, and uh, uh, founded a health clinic there, and as a practitioner, uh, did extraordinary things for her community, and is now doing extraordinary things for the country as the Surgeon General of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Regina Benjamin. Thank you. You know, I'm a longtime champion of the power of prevention. Health does not occur in the doctor's office and the hospitals only. Health also occurs where we live, where we work, where we learn, where we play, and where we pray. I believe that prevention offers the greatest opportunity to improve the health of America's families now and for decades to come. 
I also believe that prevention is a key to building a stronger and more sustainable health care system. Prevention is not new to the national dialogue. However, in recent years, it's become much more vital and much more relevant than ever before. It's become an imperative. And this is largely due be to the changing dynamics and demographics as more American families struggle to deal with chronic illnesses such as diabetes and hypertension and strokes and the tragic toll they take. And the case for focusing more of the nation's attention and resources on prevention is more than a theory. It's a reality grounded in science and experience. Preventing chronic illness is a profound and measurable effect on our communities, our economy, impacting people of all ages and ethnicities and economic strata. We know that with better health, children attend school more regularly <coughs> and are better able to learn. We know with better health, more adults are more productive and work more days. And with better health, seniors can better maintain their independence. On the other hand, we know that the lack of prevention takes a devastating toll on the patients and their families and their communities and their workplaces. Just four mo modifiable risk, health risk behaviors um, account for most of the things that we see, and those are lack of physical activity, poor nutrition, tobacco use, and excessive alcohol consumption. They're responsible for much of the illness and death that's related to chronic illnesses. Almost 50% of adults have at least one chronic condition, such as diabetes or hypertension. And this year, in 2012, more than 800,000 Americans will die from heart disease. And the overall cost uh, resulting from cardiovascular disease is $444 billion every single year. And there are many more statistics to tell the same story. We have to make prevention part of our everyday lives and empower people to make better health choices. Good health comes from clean air and water and safe outdoor spaces for physical activity, work site wellness programs, healthy foods, violence-free environments, and healthy homes. Good health also comes from awareness, and the public and private sectors have to work together to integrate prevention into the fabric of our daily work and our family lives. Everyone, businesses, educators, Healthcare institutions, governments, communities, and individuals can play a role in creating a healthy and fit nation. So I'm really pleased that the Obama administration has launched a broad agenda to help Americans get healthy, live longer, stay well, and thrive. The Affordable Care Act provides a historic funding commitment to promote prevention and wellness. And the law established a National Prevention, Health Promotion, and Public Health Council that I have the honor to chair. This council consists of 17 cabinet level heads of agencies such as Departments of Transportation, Department of Agriculture, Department of Health, Labor, EPA, HUD, Defense. 17 cabinet level members sitting around talking about prevention, first time ever. And this past summer, um, the council released the first ever national prevention strategy. And our goal is to move our healthcare system from a focus on sickness and disease to a focus on wellness and prevention. If we truly want to reform health in this country, we need to prevent people from getting sick in the first place, to stop the illness and stop the disease before it ever starts. So in addition to the state of the art medicine, we need a new approach to promoting prevention in our communities. We want to change the way we think about health in this country and that calls for the nation to take a more holistic and integrative approach to community community health, everything from safe highways and worksite wellness programs to clean air and healthy foods. And the goal of the National Prevention Strategy is to increase the number of Americans who are healthy at every stage of life. Whether you're two or 92, we want you to be healthy. Like one of my patients says, I want to get old, but I want to be upright. <laughs> we have four pillars to the prevention strategy, and those four pillars is healthy and safe communities, clinical and community preventive services, empowered people, and elimination of health disparities. And if we follow the recommendations of the National Prevention Strategy, we can prevent or at least, <clears throat> excuse me, at least significantly decrease the five leading causes of death. And if we can do that, we can become a more healthy and fit nation. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce to you um, one of my favorite people. I'm a fan of, of B. Smith. And as you know, she's a, a respected expert in what we call affordable yet elegant living. 
and all of us remember her from B. Smith with style, and she certainly has style, but she also had B. Smith with style home collection. And it could be summed up as I think best with the New York Daily News calls B. Smith, one of the most important African-American style mavens of all time, B. Smith. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. That was quite an introduction. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that we're all here together because this is such an important time in our life. Um, everybody knows that I have restaurants. I feed people, but I also feed them much more than the food in the restaurant. It's about lifestyle, the way we live. Um, it's about being here. It's about spreading the word that um, it's, it's, I've always said that if more kids were taught to use kitchen utensils and gardening utensils and sewing machines, they'd be less likely to use guns and knives against each other. So health and wellness for our children mentally and physically is very important to me. Always has been and it always will be. One of the initiatives that I have uh, is that I like to do healthy menu makeovers. And I do those for various companies like uh, Merck for diabetes. Uh, I, my husband and I um, are very involved with the Kidney Association. I've done healthy menu makeovers for the Kidney Association. And I will continue to spread the word, you know. We don't have to, I think that we should live the way our great, great grandparents lived off of the community and the country and the gardening and, and really, you know, really getting in there, even if it's a small patch. Again, when a child sees something growing, that child wants to help it grow too. And we want to help our children grow. And they have to grow mentally, physically, and spiritually. And that's very important. Now, the other, the other side of it, being in the restaurant business, now when you come to my restaurant, you could have fried green tomatoes or you could have grilled green tomatoes. You can be responsible for the meal that you have when you're in the restaurant. And you can ask for things the way you want and need them that make you healthy and uh, alert and, you know, wanting to live as long as we can and have a great life and, a great, and live in great communities with people who are like us. So I'm about spreading the word, and um, I love what Mrs. Obama does. Um, it's not just about food, it really is about exercise and really taking care of yourself and taking care of the folks who are around you. We all have to just give and be a part of our communities like our grandparents and our, our moms and our dads or, or, or a part of the churches that we go to or the synagogues or wherever we're going. Um, it's very important, I think, that we touch each other in, in the right way. We, we're spreading the word that it's about health, wellness, and education. If, if the kids are educated properly, they will grow up to be the next generation of women like this and people who are on this uh, here up here with me and we're just going to grow a better country and I'm happy that Mrs. Obama is doing that and we're all doing it too. We're a part of it. So I have somebody very special to um, invite up here in a few minutes. Kathleen Sebelius was sworn as, in as the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services on April 28, 2009. Since taking office, she has led ambitious efforts to improve America's health and enhance the delivery of human services to some of the nation's most vulnerable populations, including the young children, as I was talking about before, and those with disabilities and the elderly. As part of this historic health care law, the Affordable Care Act, she is implementing reform that, reforms that have, been, that have ended many of the insurance industry's worst abuses and will help 34 million uninsured Americans. Just that number alone, un, uninsured Americans, is sad for a country like this. But we'll, we're going to help them to get that help coverage that they need. The law is a 
historic accomplishment for improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities. And right now, I want to um, welcome HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And um, I'm thrilled to be introduced by the style maven of DC, <laughs> B. Smith, who um, does so much not only here but around the country to promote health and wellness and looking good all the time, which I think is a big piece of the puzzle. That We've got a great health panel today um, with Drs. Schroeder and Gaines who have important media outlets and we'll carry this message far and wide. Um, we've got a couple of our great health leaders, uh, Dr. Regina Benjamin, the Surgeon General, and Myra Alvarez, who's the Director of Public Policy and our health reform team. And I know you just heard from my good friend Cecilia Munoz, who directs the Domestic Policy Council. But I'm delighted um, to have a chance to join you for a few minutes and um, commemorating, among other things, National Minority Health Month, which is the month of April. And I think it makes it logical for us to have a conversation about the issues of minority health this month and have all of you here, and particularly to talk a little bit about our successes but the challenges that lie ahead. Now, I don't think there's any question that the last three years have been pretty historic in terms of health policy. Um, but we also need to recognize, even with some of the advances, the health care disparities among racial and ethnic minorities still stifle opportunity in way too many communities across this country. It was 46 years ago when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called inequality in health care the most shocking and inhumane form of injustice. He singled out health disparities because Dr. King said there's nothing more fundamental to opportunity than good health. And the inequalities that existed 46 years ago in health, unfortunately, are still with us today. At a most basic level, health is about freedom freedom to go about our daily lives without experiencing pain, freedom to live long enough to achieve our goals and to get to know our grandchildren, freedom from the constant worries about a chronic condition or whether or not you're going to go bankrupt trying to pay health care bills. And it's why it's so upsetting that the gaps in health that Dr. King described over four decades ago still remain in communities across America today. When we talk about African American children having a higher infant mortality rate than many in developing countries, or a third of young and middle-aged Latinos having no health insurance at all, or 60 million Americans of all races living in areas without enough primary care providers. Words like shocking and inhumane still apply today in America. What we know too well is the cost reaches beyond sickness, beyond pain, beyond lost lives, and those are real costs. But the inequalities spill over into other areas, costing our economy an estimated $300 billion a year in productivity. Listen to that number, $300 billion a year. It would go a long way to pay for a lot of health care for a lot of folks. What's clear, I think, that we have a moral and we have an economic obligation to narrow those gaps in health. And that's why this president, over the last three years, has examined really all the factors which affect our health. The food we eat, the water we drink, the homes we live in, the neighborhoods, where we work. And we asked what it would take to give every American the opportunity to live a healthy life and achieve her fullest potential. So we have the Affordable Care Act, which is guided by a national prevention strategy and supporting local efforts like healthier school lunches and smoke-free housing campaigns that help make the healthy choices more easy and more affordable. 
And we're looking at strategies that work in the prevention area and helping them become models for the rest of the country. And you heard B talk about Mrs. Obama's effort. There's no question that having a first lady who shines a bright light on an issue like childhood obesity is an enormous step forward to bring that issue out of the shadows and make it clear that we need to do some important work on behalf of our children. But it's not enough to make sure that kids are getting physical activity or that communities have supermarkets and fresh food. Those are steps forward. But definitely we need more doctors. We need more doctors' offices and health centers in underserved areas. We need more regular access to primary care in minority and underserved communities. Now, the kind of care that we're talking about are really catching problems when they're early, before problems become acute. Keeping people healthy in the first place, rather than waiting until they're sick and come through the doors of an emergency room. We know that one in three Latinos and one in five African Americans don't have a regular source of health care. They don't have health insurance and they don't have a primary health home and that is simply unacceptable. And that's one of the reasons the Affordable Care Act made an historic investment in the primary care workforce. We've expanded the national network of community health centers, which in are incredibly important backbone of primary and preventive health, allowing them to build additions, add services, stay open longer, and serve millions more patients. We've added thousands of providers. In fact, we've tripled the number of providers in the National Health Service Corps. Now, some of you may be familiar with that. It's, it's kind of the Peace Corps for health workers, and it's, to me, the best kind of win-win deal. If a young healthcare provider, nurse practitioner, doctor, mental health tech, behavioral health tech, agrees to practice in an underserved area, the federal government helps pay off their student loans. So it works out to be a very beneficial deal. And as one of the graduates of the National Health Service Corps, Regina Benjamin can tell you, often when you're assigned to one of those areas, you end up staying and practicing in those areas for the rest of your career, and that again is a very important step forward. We're committed to recruiting more minority providers who we know drastically improve health within their own communities. We need culturally competent providers. We need providers with language skills to reach out to some of our most vulnerable populations. And that means more people are gonna get the care that helps them stay well and stay out of the hospital. It's good for their health, but it's also good for all of our health. It's good for our families, for businesses, and for government budgets, because it's a lot cheaper to pay for diabetes screening at a clinic than deal with an emergency treatment or even surgery at a hospital. But what we know is even with the new investments, people are still gonna get sick and have accidents that require care. And minorities are less likely to have health care coverage that they need to get that important health care. And that's why the law also deals with, as B said, expanding coverage to what we estimate will be 32 to 34 million Americans. Already, what we know is two and a half million young Americans are on their parents' plans. And of that two and a half million, 1.3 million are minority young Americans, and that's a big step forward. So we have a million uh, young people who have coverage today because of this act. So we put all those pieces together, new prevention, new strategies, more primary outreach, more focus on healthy living and access to affordable insurance. And there's no question the health care law is our strongest tool to fight health disparities but it's not the only one we've got. Last year, our department released its first ever department-wide action plan to reduce health disparities. Now, this is not just another white paper gathering dust on a shelf. It's a roadmap, and we are pressing down on the accelerator. We publish new data standards that will help us get a clearer picture of health disparities. We're providing additional support to community health workers and started a promontory, yes, 
must be a community health worker. Thank you very much. Actually, we can all give her a round of applause. How about that? We've started a new program of promotories, community leaders who will be reaching out to their neighbors and friends uh, around health strategies. And we're working to close the gaps for some of the illnesses that hit the minority populations the hardest. Now, all of these actions make up some of the most aggressive and comprehensive health disparities agenda our country has ever seen. We have momentum and we have opportunity and we are committed to continuing to work hard to make the most of it. What I want to do is work with you so that we're not just describing well the health disparities, but we're actually closing the gaps. We've taken some big steps to do that and with your help, uh, we will continue that important work forward. So again, thank you very much for being here. I, I think I can take a yeah. question or two. Yeah. Um, okay, great, thank you. Yeah. So thank you, Secretary Sebelius. You have no small feat under your personal direction and we are all thankful for your leadership. We have a quick five minutes for a question and answer because the Secretary has a very busy schedule. So I wanted to start with our media panelists. Uh, Dr. Schroeder, do you have a question for the Secretary? I do, thank you very much. Um, good morning, Secretary, good afternoon. Um, you've talked a lot about the importance of prevention and wellness in the Affordable Care Act and it being a priority area for the Obama administration. Um, as you know, though, the uh, recent CDC report found uh, increasing rates of obesity and uh, chronic conditions like diabetes among Hispanics and other multicultural populations. And in part, this is because of cultural habits and also because, at least in part, Hispanics traditionally haven't given as much priority to prevention uh, as other communities. On the positive side, culturally relevant diet and wellness programs have been shown to be effective in preventing and, and controlling diabetes and other chronic conditions. Could you talk a little bit more about what some of the most important and specific ways uh, that, that you have in the Affordable Care Act and, and uh, your plans to supporting the wider uh, development and availability and use of these culturally relevant prevention and wellness programs among Hispanics? Sure, um, I think that uh, we've got to do all of the above um, quickly. One is community-based efforts. Uh, the, Recovery Act gave some resources for the first time to really invest in community strategies. And I've been in uh, South Texas, for instance, where a whole series of restaurants are doing everything from um, reprocessing how tortillas are made so that they are um, less fatty to coming up with um, healthier options and beginning to do some outreach and education to folks um, around healthier eating strategies and involving a lot of neighborhood people in those conversations. And I think that's, that's a piece of the puzzle. Certainly, the reformatting of food served in our schools is a big piece of the puzzle. I mean, the fact that we finally have, uh, for the first time in 40 years, updated school nutrition standards will hit all of our kids um, and reintroduction in lots of classes for um, physical education is a piece of the puzzle. Having health insurance, I mean, what we know is that one out of three uh, Latinos often lacks health insurance, and what that means is too many people are not getting checkups, are not getting early preventive care, are um, perhaps resisting care. The people who have health insurance, the introduction with the Affordable Care Act of preventive screenings, mammogram, colon cancer screenings, childhood immunizations without co-pays or co-insurance means another financial barrier is down and it's really an opportunity uh, to take advantage of that. And I'd say the effort to have a stream of funding specifically not only to recruit more doctors but to recruit more doctors out of the minority community and culturally competent providers and place them in the underserved areas, I think, is a piece of the puzzle. So we're trying to hit this from all fronts, more providers, more prevention, different standards, more community outreach and involvement, and education um, is, a, is an important piece. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, let's, since this is a town hall, let's take a question from the audience. Laurel, do you want to pick an audience member to provide us with a question? Talib Kareem with the Washington Informer, an Afro-American. Dr. Sabilis, I salute you as one of the staffers who worked on health 
reform when I was uh, a Hill staffer during the healthcare debate. I really salute and applaud the way you've uh, championed it. And I wanted to ask you about something we see in the African American communities and even the Latino communities. A lot of the places that provide health care are themselves not healthy. And one of the things that Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, when I was working on her staff, wanted to do was to put some money to actually create green health care centers. That, that, that would be health care centers that would be, you know, either gold or platinum lead mm -hmm. standard. Um, and I wanted to find out whether or not, even it, though it didn't get into the health uh, reform law, whether or not your uh, agency would be open to those types of initiatives even still. Well, I think that's a great idea. Uh, clearly, it's um, a little hollow to get um, a lot of advice from a health worker who he or she themselves are not um, living what they preach. You know, it's the um, action speaks a little louder than words. Uh, I know that there are efforts underway with a lot of health centers to do um, various kinds of employee programs of exercise incentives and disease management. I mean, one of the most stunning things, and again, this is not just a, an issue in certain pockets. I was at the Cleveland Clinic a month ago and um, often regarded as one of the gold standards, you know, for health providers. One of the things that they have discovered is that for their employees, Cleveland Clinic employees, less than a third of uh, their employees who have been identified with some kind of chronic condition, diabetes, heart disease, whatever, are in any kind of disease management program. And so they're not managing their cholesterol, they're not managing their blood pressure, they're not. And these are the health workers for the Cleveland Clinic. So they have engaged in a very aggressive strategy around getting their own employees invested, involved, they are paying financial incentives. They, they have found very quickly that it actually, the little bit of money up front has produced dramatic health savings. We're trying to take that model and put it in the federal employee plan, at least in some model programs, because I think we've got to get you know, really serious about having people, even people with um, ongoing insurance who uh, have some kind of a condition or precondition identified if they're not taking the steps to actually deal with that condition uh, they are at risk of of a lot of pain and problems so we'd be very open to discussion around health centers but I think it's a more universal we love employers across the board to be very creative, and it's one of the strategies that we're testing what works. You know, what works to get employees in a health plan encouraged and involved in taking some steps to deal with their own health, and what kind of incentives work, what kind of wraparound works, because I think in the long run, um, we need to learn a lot more about that. Um, we have a Million Hearts program that some of you hopefully will be involved in, are involved in, which is really a strategy that says we could save Americans from a million heart attacks and strokes in the next five years by doing some very simple things, ABCs. Aspirin for protocol for those folks who have had heart disease or have a heart condition, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, and smoking cessation. The ABCs, a million people could avoid a heart attack or a stroke over the next five years. That's a big deal. So those kinds of things, I think, are ones that we just need to figure out what works the best and encourage everybody to take advantage of them. Great. Thank you, Secretary Sebelius. Um, we're going to try to fit in one more question, okay. if that's possible. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gaines and the audience of The Grio. Could you offer us a question from your audience? Sure. Thank you. Um, so we've, you know, already discussed the statistics so far and how many people um, the Affordable Care Act has helped so far, African Americans and uh, people from minority groups in general. My question uh, involves the Supreme Court uh, pending decision. Um, you know, if the Supreme Court decides that the individual mandate um, is unconstitutional and further decides to invalidate the Affordable Care Act in general, how will that affect those that are currently or newly covered in all these other gains that we've made so far with this? And is there a plan B to, to cover these folks? Well, it's a question you won't be surprised that we get asked a lot. Um, and the position right now is pretty clear. We are confident this law is constitutional. Um, 
based on 70 years of legal precedent of expanding the Commerce Clause, and we are aggressively implementing the law to make sure that people know, frankly, what's at stake if, indeed, uh, something were to happen um, down the road, or certainly if the repeal calls in Congress were to take place. I think people need to understand what they stand to lose. Um, so we're aggressively doing that, and you know we'll be ready if the court um, makes some kind of a ruling, but I think it's more important for us to push forward, and frankly, since this is my last uh, opportunity, I, I want to ask for all of your help. Uh, the opportunity to have 34, 35 plus million Americans uh, be enrolled and involved in health insurance is one that is really just a promise. And it's a promise that can only be realized without some very aggressive and innovative outreach strategies. We need to get people ready to think about what benefits may be coming their way, to think about enrollment. We need some very creative strategies to think about how to reach the most vulnerable populations who need the help the most, but maybe the least likely to be sitting at a computer and going online, or the least likely to you know, want to sign up for anything feeling that there could be um, some sort of trick involved in it. So I would love um, your help, your thoughts, your ideas about how to uh, spend a lot of time, frankly, in the remainder of 2012 and certainly throughout 2013 with an outreach education enrollment, pre-enrollment campaign, because I think that's going to be one of our big challenges. We actually, uh, Dr. Gaines, have been thinking about uh, the number of states who are protesting now saying they want nothing to do with the health care law, and when the court decides that this law is fully constitutional, suddenly come rushing in the door and say, we want to uh, participate in this. So we're really trying to shadow box on all kinds of um, strategies. But your thoughts about how to move that forward, and I just see that uh, Dr. Nadine Grazia is sitting at the table. I couldn't see you carefully earlier as, again, one of our health leaders who leads the action plan on disparities and is the assistant secretary in charge of um, minority health at HHS. And when I mentioned the others on the panel, I, I didn't mean to neglect Nadine. I just was so dazzled by B, I couldn't see you. <laughs> um, but thank you all for being here today. Thank you for the work that you're going to do. But we need you as great partners. Great. So having the secretary was a great way to get this conversation started. But given that it is National Minority Health Month, we are so fortunate to have with us the director of our Office of Minority Health, Dr. Nadine Gracia. And again, this is a town hall, so we want to make sure we get questions answered from our audience. So I'm going to head on over to Tori. Tori, if you want to pick an audience member to ask a question for Dr. Gracia so we can get this conversation started. Can you please tell us your name and what you're affiliated with? My name is Jasmine Bias, and I'm a blogger at I Am Moms. I cover um, topics for South Asian moms who want it all. And one of my topics is mental health issues. Um, in the South Asian community, there is a great stigma surrounding the acknowledgement of the existence of mental health issues and obtaining treatment for them. Uh, what what policies exist or what policy solutions have been proposed to address this issue? So you raise certainly an excellent point and one um, really important point to make is how mental health is really important to our overall health and yet um, certainly in the dialogue about mental health, whether it's depression, anxiety, uh, or uh, longer term issues that uh, often it is a taboo topic uh, within, certainly within minority communities. And I think the Affordable Care Act certainly uh, is one of the most important policies that we have to really help us in advancing m mental health uh, in the nation. And so certainly through uh, one of the provisions with regards to access to preventive screenings at no cost, with no copay or no deductible, uh, that depression screening, those types of mental health services are included uh, in that, that menu, if you will, of, of recommended screenings. 
but what also happened in the Affordable Care Act was the creation of new offices of minority health uh, within the Department of Health and Human Services, and one of them is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, recognizing that there are disparities when it comes to behavioral health issues. And so that office actually just had uh, its official launch during National Minority Health Month and is really uh, doing some pioneering work. It's led by Dr. Lark Huang. And one of the things that uh, she is, is leading within her agency is actually even looking at grants that they're implementing and, and that they're developing pilot programs to say that grant applicants, those who apply for grants from, from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, have to actually articulate uh, how their programs are going to help reduce disparities. So this is really a great incorporation across the agency to think about not only behavioral health and mental health, but the disparities that also exist in minority communities. Thank you, Dr. Gracia. Yeah, that's a great point, talking about the integration of mental health issues and agencies of HHS across the department to make sure that that conversation stays at the forefront of our minds. So let's come back to our media panelists. Uh, Dr. Schroeder, Dr. Gaines, can you uh, pose a question to one of our panelists about uh, the health care law or about health disparities and what we're doing from your audiences specifically? Sure. Maybe I'll just follow up uh, with a follow-up question for Dr. Gracia. Um, within our community, uh, we have both uh, Hispanic consumers as well as professionals that, uh, that are a part of it. And one of the questions we received yesterday for, for this panel was, um, what is being done to ensure training of culturally and linguistically competent professionals and paraprofessionals in the health, mental health and substance, uh, substance abuse as well as health, mental health promotion prevention uh, areas? So, You've talked about some. If you could talk a little bit more, and we've got a few questions about cultural competency training specifically um, for, uh, for implementing these, these programs. Another excellent point that, as the Secretary mentioned last year, we released, uh, for the first time ever, our department has uh, an action plan to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities. And within that action plan, one of the goal areas is to strengthen the health and human services workforce. And that includes, it's not only the, the traditional clinical workforce that you may think of, but certainly the behavioral health workforce as well. One of the components of the action plan is, is to address, to enhance the cultural and linguistic competency of the workforce. Uh, my office, the Office of Minority Health, actually is leading an initiative to enhance the culturally, culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health care, the class standards, uh, which were first implemented and in, in issued in 2000. That we're, We know that the population has changed uh, over, over the years and that there's certainly an increasing need and demand to have these culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health care. So this is something that we're working on across the department uh, to really help to promote across the country. Absolutely, and I think you know we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the National Health Service Corps and the Affordable Care Act's investment in the National Health Service Corps. Since President Obama came into office, we've been able to triple the size of the National Health Service Corps and today have over 10,000 providers across the country serving in some of our most underserved communities. These young professionals come in through the program. They receive two years of loan repayment or scholarship programs in exchange for two years of service in these underserved communities. But the best part part of the people that go through that program is that 80% of them end up staying in the communities in which they serve, contributing to the economic vitality of that community and the continuity of care of the people that are depending on these providers day after day. Um, so I, just a quick reminder, if people are watching online, we thank you. And we hope you are submitting your questions via the hashtag Minority Health. We're going to uh, open it up to the uh, question from our Twitter audience. So Laurel, if you want to share our question, please. Great, this is from Fia Curley one on Twitter. She asks, does the ACA improve or impact the care that minorities receive at community health centers? Sure, one of our panelists. Sure, so yes, in, indeed it does. Uh, the, the Affordable Care Act will basically increase uh, our investments uh, in community health centers. Um, that There's $11 billion over the next five years that are going to community health centers. One, to actually help those that are existing centers expand the services that they provide. They, community health centers are such an important source of care for underserved communities uh, and really play a role as being the healthcare safety net. And so providing those services, not only the primary clinical care services, but also expanding those services to include oral health, behavioral health, and pharmacy services. 
Uh, there are also funds that are going to actually establish new community health center sites. Uh, and just the last fall, the Health Resources and Services Administration uh, awarded over $28 million to 67 community health center sites around the country. So making this investment is very important because more than half uh, of the uh, the patients who are actually seen in these community health centers are racial and ethnic minorities. So certainly this is a huge benefit uh, to increasing access to care and also increasing access to quality of care. Absolutely. Dr. Gaines and Dr. Schroeder, do your media outlets have the opportunity to link um, Americans with their community health center? It's um it's done so kind of case by case. So if we write a particular story um, about a chronic disease like diabetes, we tend to link to organizations that are, that are doing community work, um, but not so much as a, a set listing. That may be something that we need to consider. Absolutely. We have a link on our website where people can input their zip code. <laughs> you could input your zip code and up comes the list of community health centers in your neighborhood so that everyone always knows they have an access um, the, the opportunity to access care right in their neighborhood. So we strongly encourage you to link to that. I would just add that we are working towards that as well. Um, one of the ways that we gain cultural competency in, in serving Hispanic Latinos here is we work internationally. Uh, we're launching some of our programs uh, right now in Mexico uh, with Walmart and some other large employers. Uh, and actually just because of its development um, in, in those countries, in Mexico specifically, people can go in and uh, find doctors near them and you punch a button and uh, Google Maps pops up and you can actually find the, the doctor right there in, in Mexico. So uh, we'll be porting that over to our domestic uh, uh, portfolio as well. So it's uh, very useful and I think very important. That's great, thank you. I think one of the great opportunities about a town hall, a Twitter discussion, our Facebook pages, is this opportunity to capitalize on the reach that these social media outlets really have, particularly in today's um, society. And when you look at communities of color, we are actually more likely to be on social media uh, outlets like Twitter, like Facebook, to have a cell phone and communicate um, with each other about health issues. So we really are appreciative of you being here today and hope you will uh, learn from this discussion other opportunities to strengthen your websites and our partnership. Um, so let's go to the audience. Tori, do you want to uh, select an audience member for a question, please? Certainly. Please say your name and the organization in which you're affiliated. Hi, my name is uh, Monica Peters. Uh, I blog for the Health Journalism Task Force, the HJT.com. And my question uh, relates to ACA and dental health care. Um, does any of the ACA provisions prevent dentists from denying services to patients uh, who use Medicare? And will dentists also be prohibited from denying emergency dental services under ACA? And also, in addition to community health services, well, in addition to community health centers, uh, will ACA have provisions to have dentists on staff in emergency rooms as well? Thank you. Okay. I could take that. Um, obviously, oral health care is essential to our physical health in general, and it's often um, neglected in communities of color, actually in the American community in general. Uh, finding a dentist in your community is often a challenge in and of itself. The Affordable Care Act does take positive steps in addressing oral health challenges across the country. As part of the essential health benefits package in the future, um, children will have access to oral health care services. I think for those of us that are here in the Washington, D.C. community, just a few years ago, the story of DeMonte Driver and the tragic death and the impact on his family and our communities was awful. And I don't think any of us want to see that happen in any of our communities ever again. So the opportunity to address pediatric oral health care um, was a top priority for the Affordable Care Act, and we're working on, on that process moving forward. And I think coupled with that is our investment in the National Health Service Corps specifically targets dentists to reach underserved communities so that they have more access to dentists and be able to um, face those oral health care challenges early on. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a great opportunity to see your dentist, to be able to catch those cavities before they become something worse, and we're, we're making steps in, in that right direction. Great. Okay. Uh, Laurel, do you want to pick another audience member? Yes. Hi, my name is Anne Marie Benitez, and I'm with the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy. Um, well, first of all, thank you for all being here, and we're so grateful for the initiatives that are currently existing in the ACA. And I have kind of two questions in regards to teen pregnancy. One is, how would um, 
Are there any thoughts to build on the current initi initiatives that are already in the Affordable Care Act? And two, in the um, report that came out by the Agency for Healthcare Research, the um, disparities report, I noticed that teen pregnancy wasn't a part of it. So I don't know how the issues were decided that weren't included in it, and are there any ways to add teen pregnancy in it? Because, for example, half of Latinas and African Americans get pregnant at least once before the age of 20. So it's a huge issue within our community. I don't really have an answer. The National Prevention Strategy actually has um, seven priority areas, and one is reproductive and sexual health. And so we've um, addressed um, adolescent health particularly. And within the Office of the um, Assistant Secretary for Health, we have an Office of Adolescent Health, which is newly created approximately a year, year and a half ago, and have a number of programs going. Actually, I just left a panel where she, um, the director really gave a presentation. Um, and we can get you much more information on it. It is a priority of the department as well as it fits into the national prevention strategy. Absolutely. Um, and actually, you know, you bring up a, a great discussion point in that, you know, one of the biggest challenges with teen pregnancy is reaching a population that might not be aware of the health care services available to them or might not feel comfortable having a discussion with their parents or with other adults in their life. So how do we reach people where they're at to talk about health care, to talk about questions that might be on their mind? Um, B, can you talk a little bit about your experience in being you know, this iconic restaurateur and have this amazing outlet for communication via your restaurants and talking about healthy food, how that has helped overcome those communication barriers that we often face, particularly in communities of color? Well, I think that because these young people are not being, you know, nobody's really getting to them, that a, a restaurant like ours, which is large and um, in which we have lots of different activities in, but we all, we tend to focus more on food health. Right, yeah. Because that's, that, that is not sort of interfering with their real, their life. Absolutely. It's something that they're learning and that they're learning how to do. I mean, and as we get into the school systems too, I think again that when kids are taught how to cook, how to prepare a meal, um, how to prepare a party, how, you know, or even taught how to do dishes, nobody really teaches them. They just say, do the dishes, but they don't really teach them. So I think in many ways, um, that lifestyle part of school, and when I was young it was home economics, <laughs> and I am who I am today because of home economics, cooking and sewing. <laughs> um, to the point that I also at that time in my small town outside of Pittsburgh would bring in the big DJ from the, uh, from the city and we would do fundraisers. When you learn to do fundraisers early, you know about giving back. Um, when you are still in high school and you can be a candy striper at the airport, I mean at the uh, hospital, then you understand about helping people and health and wellness in a different way. I think what happens in a lot of schools is things are thrown at kids, so to speak, but there's not a platform so that they can really kind of understand where they are. Um, and when we were talking, we just heard about, you know, young people and getting pregnant, and, and that goes two ways. It's not just the young lady, it's the young man also. So there, there, there still is a lot of homework that has to be done, and I think the right types of classes on a, on a, a whole different level, so that we're talking to them and they're not running away from us. They're like, oh, there's interest. Somebody cares about me and, and I can do better for myself through this particular initiative. Those types of things have to be dealt with. No, absolutely. I think, you know, communication is essential to good health. And I think, you know, from our media panelists, if you could talk a little bit about how your communication tool has helped your audience be, live healthier lives or be more educated consumers of health care, we're definitely open to, to those discussions as well. Definitely. I mean, one of the, the goals of our health section on thegrill.com is to 
really take these complicated topics and break it down. Kind of what you're saying, to meet people where they are, um, not just talking at people with science, but actually making it applicable to their lives and how they can, can make changes that will push them more towards health. Um, you know, and I, there's always the issue, you know, of, we talk about, you know, food deserts, so although I, I don't, I'm not particularly fond of the term, but we all know what that means, and certain communities that don't have access to safe environments to do outdoors activities or to go for a jog and things like that. And, you know, the worry is always that it's going to further create a divide between um, you know, economically speaking, between the haves and have, have nots, even along the lines of health. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we do the best that we can to bring a lot of that to our readers um, in, in hopes that we can continue to push that forward. That's great. Yeah. And speaking about going to where people are, we've tried to do a number of things. We've had a Surgeon General's app challenge to, with our obesity and, and fitness and wellness program to try to have apps that are. Um, actually you can keep on your iPhone and just be healthy. Another thing we've done is try to, um, last year you may have heard about the fact that uh, talk to another a number of, of women as to why they're not exercising and they'll say, well, I don't want to sweat my hair back. And so we wanted to do something to make it easier to exercise and not worry about your hair. So we sponsored a, a exercise friendly hair competition at the Bonner Brother Hair Show. And at that show, it was we had over um, 600, 700 hairstylists there competing for this, which is where people are. So we, we did it the first year, and the second year was, uh, again, really successful. And trying to give women the tools or, or to make it easier, something to make it easier, not, not have a barrier there. We also wanted to use the hairdressers to not just stop there, because they have these, uh, not just women, guys in their, in their um, salons, and they're a captive audience. So we started doing things like giving them health information, making them our ambassadors. You heard about the, the Million Hearts campaign, to just simply teach them about the Million Hearts campaign. While they're, you're sitting in the chair, they can talk about the ABCs of your blood pressure and aspirin and cholesterol. And using that to go where people are. I mean, we have to now try to figure out how do we get people engaged. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I would just add that uh, in about the 12 years that we've been uh, working with online Hispanic communities and, and you know, working to educate them and, and deliver health information, I'd say one of the most important things that we've learned um, is, is that we need to make it fun. We need to make it interesting, fun, and relevant. Um, and, and to do that, we've really worked hard to create, uh, to, essentially we use topics and, and, and personalities that are important in the Hispanic Latino community. Um, these might be celebrities, these, these might be sports stars that have a particular uh, health issue or concern, write a, a, a sort of feature story around that and use something we call slideshows that then brings them deeper into uh, in, informing them about, uh, say, breast cancer screening and then giving them a link then and, and really encouraging them, you know, have you had your mammogram recently? Um, so it's really taking them, capturing them with them with something that's engaging, relevant, and interesting. Um, going down a little deeper with some education and then making it personal um, and, and relevant and actionable. And I think that's really part of the, the, the trick that we've learned. And I just have to now tell you about my Surgeon General's journey to joy. <laughs> <laughs> so many people know about that. It's because you talk about fun. fun. Yeah. Yeah, but the fun. The fun is so important. Um, work with the promotories and some others to talk about it. It's, we've taken the joy out of being healthy. You know. It, Individuals aren't happy. There's no joy there. There's no joy for the clinicians. There's no joy for the, even the insurers. We have to put the joy back into it. And you can't underestimate how important that is. Um, we have to find our own joy. My joy may be different from yours. One person may want find joy in health by running a, a marathon. Yeah, for whatever reason, they may want to run a marathon. But <laughs> another person may find their health care joy in fitting in an old pair of jeans, and yet another person may simply want to sit up all afternoon to be able to play with their grandkids. We have to find our own personal joy. And our goal, our role, in, in particularly in the, in the, from the government standpoint, is to give you the tools to make it easy to find your own health care joy. Things like the My Plate or Mi Plato is, is a simple tool to help you eat healthier and have a healthier plate. 
um, we're doing things around the country around walking Surgeon General's walks. We, we're doing some Zumbathons and having fun. We're trying to do something we call the Surgeon General's Dance Break. So if any of you can join that, get the radio stations to just play music for about 30 seconds or 60 seconds and stop what you're doing and just dance in place and have a good time. And even though you may not burn a lot of calories, it's a great mental health break. So, but bringing fun and joy back to, to health. That, that's great. Uh, and I definitely think that um, from the federal government's perspective, we're doing our best to make these tools available. But obviously, our media partners, like a website like thegrio.com or a website like Hola Doctor, both are also essential tools to helping Americans live healthier lives. So let's go back to the audience and see, Tori, if you want to pick an audience member. Please state your name and the organization in which you're affiliated. My name is Dr. Ivor Horn. I'm from Children's National Medical Center here in Washington, D.C., and I'm also a contributor to MyBrownBaby.com. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about children's health and the Affordable Care Act for children's health. One of the things that we know, and you guys have talked about it, is access to care for children. One of the challenges is that a lot of children who are, who are um, eligible for care are not getting that service, primarily because it's so difficult for the families and the process of them getting Medicaid is very difficult. What are we doing to make that process simpler for children so that the children who already qualify for um, Medicaid get the services that they need and get the Affordable Care Act? And I applaud you, um, Surgeon General, for getting active and encouraging us to get active and find joy and talking about the hair. Um, we talked about it a little bit on MyBrownBaby.com, and one of the things that we do with our children is we really encourage them to look inside and see what's inside that's beautiful so that they can work on the inside and work from the inside out. That's great. So I, I will start off. I'm sure that uh, others will join in it. So as a pediatrician, I think that uh, Children's health and prevention certainly are, are, are critical, um, certainly for uh, the lifeline of our nation, that, that the children really are our future. Um, when you look and, and really consider the, the components of the Affordable Care Act, there's so much information, and, and as we've said, it's really important to try to make sure that communities are aware uh, of, of the services and the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, but also to be able to connect people to care and, and pointing out some of the challenges that, that you've certainly articulated. Um, some of the components of the Affordable Care Act that I think are going to be important and certainly things that we're also doing in, in our office, in the Office of Minority Health, are things such as, as people who can actually help individuals connect them to care. So for example, having navigator programs that are going to be able to be important resources, trusted members of their community that can help be that bridge to connecting people to care. We talked about, for example, the promotoras, we talked about community health workers, all being important conduits to really increasing uh, people's awareness, but also helping to really try to reduce the difficulty in getting uh, access to care, because we know those can be uh, some of the challenges that communities face. Uh, um, and I think that the more that we have people talking about, uh, you know, how to find out where their community health centers, find out where their doctors in the area, it's really going to be some of the ways in which that we really work with families, with parents to really help them understand how to get those a that type of access to care. But I think really creating those those liaisons and strengthening those, those liaisons are going to be critical to really increasing in, uh, the number of children and, and, and young adults who are getting access to care. And along those lines, we, uh, you know, released the Surgeon General's report on breastfeeding, and and in breastfeeding, trying to encourage or assist women who want to breastfeed. That we need to be able to support them, and we know that a baby who's exclusively breastfed for the first six months of life is less likely to become obese. The mother has benefits as well as the baby. She's less likely to have ovarian cancer or breast cancer. So all these things we know are good. But it's hard because we, over 90% of women start out breastfeeding by six months, less than 17% of breastfeed. And so there's something that happens in between. And much of it's because women enter back into the workplace. And the workplace isn't as supportive. The Affordable Care Act um, put in a law with the Department of Labor to require companies over a certain size to offer a space that's clean and private other than a bathroom so a mother can pump or breastfeed. Something as simple as that. And we also have some, now that we're having the, um, the pumps and the materials are now um, counted as health equipment and, and deductible from your, your taxes. 
Absolutely. Oh. I just have a quick follow-up. Um, you know, we, as we talk about all of these things, it seems like a lot of things are going back to the community health centers, even with the dental coverage going back to the community. Realistically, right now, um, you know, we're looking at at least in African Americans, five and a half million now are, have access to preventative care. Um, and I know we're doing all these efforts to increase the number of uh, community health centers and the reach. When do you guys see that catching up? Because at the present moment, it's clear that there's a, that there's a gap. Um, I'm actually also a practicing emergency medicine physician. So a lot of patients who can't get into their primary doctor because the next appointment is three months down the line, a lot of times in community health centers. Um, and when we see them and they need to have follow-up and I discharge them, I say, go follow up with your clinic. And then I see them again in a week and they say, oh, well, the next appointment isn't until July. So at what point with all of these efforts do you guys see that starting to even out? Because until we get more centers, even you know, as we're growing with providers, when do you see that balancing? Because right now it's definitely a struggle. And on my end, I'm seeing the folks that are getting lost in the system. Well, I'll let you guys answer, but part of that is there is a shortage. I mean, there is a, we need more um, clinicians. We need more centers and more, and more private clinicians, and so we're trying to do that. But once the Affordable Care Act kicks in completely, everyone should be insured and have access, and they don't have to depend only on the, on the community health centers. They can go any place they like. In addition to the community health centers, we like to think we give very good care and they'd want to, but they, they won't have that limitation anymore. Absolutely. I think, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity to uh, improve the health of Americans. And really, you know, when you think about the Affordable Care Act, you're looking at what can arguably be said as one of the greatest pieces of minority health legislation our country has ever seen, simply because we uh, address the two greatest issues affecting health disparities today, and that's coverage and access to care. So we have a historic opportunity to make a world of difference for the lives of millions of Americans across this country, and we're thankful that we have this partnership with you all as we attempt to educate more Americans today, tomorrow, and in the future. I hate to say this, but our time is up. Uh, I think it's very easy to get lost in conversation when we're talking about the health and well-being of our friends, our families, and our loved ones. Um, so I want to thank our panel for being with us today and having this discussion. Thank you to the folks in the room and for everyone online. We will definitely continue this conversation in the weeks and months ahead. And please continue to follow us on Twitter at hhs.gov, I'm sorry, at hhs.gov, at Minority Health, or in Spanish, at hhs.latino. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to working together in the future. <laughs>